Amen. Well, like Pastor Robbie said, I'm Josh. It's been such a joy to be with you. Your church is just so friendly and loving and receiving. Uh, before the uh, early service, people were just praying for me and praying for revival. So I'm fired up. I am excited to preach to this church. And y'all are very receptive. I will preach here anytime. Y'all are hungry for... your Bibles, turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 30. 2 Chronicles chapter 30 will be in chapter 29 as well, but mostly chapter 30. And the title of my sermon is Too Long, but Not Too Late. First and Second Chronicles has a theme of hope, while First and Second Kings really focuses on the shortcomings and the sin that ultimately led to the judgment of God's nation. The theme of First and Second Chronicles is, though a righteous man fall seven times, he gets back up. It has a theme of hope that I pray this morning we can tangibly, experientially come in contact with, with this powerful message from Second uh, Chronicles chapter 30. The scene we have before us is a young man named Hezekiah, 25 years of age and king of Judah. His father was the king, but he was not a good king. He was a physical father, but he was not a spiritual father. And now this young, zealous Hezekiah is now king of God's nation, and he's seeing it in shambles. He is seeing a nation whose theme and mantra was once one nation under God is now one nation over God. Now, a nation that has forgotten God. A nation that no longer celebrates the Passover. The holiday instituted by God himself in Exodus chapter 12. Celebrating the precious blood of the Lamb. But this nation has forgotten the precious blood of the Lamb. And Hezekiah says it's been too long. But it's not too late. And here we come to verse 1 of 2 Chronicles chapter 30. And we read, And Hezekiah sent to all Israel and Judah and wrote letters also to Ephraim and Manasseh that they should come to the house of the Lord at Jerusalem to keep the Passover unto the Lord God of Israel. This is God's word. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for the, the hope that's just radiating off these pages. That this young king wants to turn his nation back to God. And while others would say it's been far too long, Hezekiah with a bold declaration leads his nation back to God because he said it's not too late. I pray that spirit would get inside of us so God can do great revival, reformation, and transformation 
in our nation, our cities, in our homes. In Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. What you imagine this morning that America has lost its Christian roots. I know what you're thinking. You're saying, Josh, you don't have to imagine that. We're, we're already there. And I understand that, but I want you to do an experiment. I want you to imagine America has lost its Christian roots to such an extent that we no longer celebrate Easter. Easter is a celebration that Jesus is alive. It is the good news of the gospel that Jesus lived the perfect life I should have lived. And he died the death I should have died. That he died on Calvary's tree bearing all my sins so that I could be forgiven. And he died a real, true, physical death. And he was buried. But three days later, he conquered death and hell and the grave. It's a celebration that Jesus is alive. But I want you to imagine if America has lost its Christian roots to such an extent we no longer celebrate Easter. We no longer celebrate Jesus is alive. We have forgotten our Savior. We have forgotten our Maker. That is where we are at in First Chronicles chapter 30. The nation that God produced and made and initiated and birthed himself has forgotten the precious blood of the Lamb. They no longer celebrate Passover. Passover, literally in Exodus chapter 12, it tells us that the Passover is about God passing over Egypt in fiery wrath and indignation. But all those who would trust in the precious blood of the Lamb were saved and redeemed and delivered out of the house of slavery and bondage. But this nation has forgotten the precious blood of the Lamb. It's been too long since they've had God at the center of their lives. It's been too long since they celebrated the Passover. It's been too long since they remembered and celebrated and got on their knees and thanked God for the precious blood of the Lamb. But it's not too late. That's Hezekiah's message this morning that yes, it's been far too long, but it is not too late. That God is the redeemer of all things, that there is nothing too hard for his hand to reach or resurrect or bring life. And that's my message to you this morning that it's been too long, it's not too late. Men, it is not too late to be the husband you are called to be. God can redeem the time for the time is in his hands. You can be the husband you are called to be. Men, you can be the father you are called to be and lead the next generation in the things of God. For the women in this room, it is not too late to be the wife you are called to be. It is not too late for weary mothers who are discouraged and faint-hearted and wondering if what they're doing really matters. It has been too long since you've had joy in your parenting, but it is not too late. God can resurrect that and bring it back. It is not too late to be the Christian and the disciple you are called to be. For those who have hid and buried their talents in the ground, as I believe there are many called and gifted Christians in this room, but for far too long we have neglected the callings and the giftings of God. It's been far too long, but it's not too late. And today my desire is to show you how Hezekiah, looking at a nation that's been far gone, for far too long. And this message about how it's not too late, how he brings this nation back to God. I want to show you five remedies of how this nation, that's been gone for far too long, how it's not too late. 
Remedy number one, self-examination. A Christian life is a reflective life. A, a Christian life looks into the mirror of the Word of God and examines oneself. The way this revival, this change, this reformation comes is through self-examination. If you have your Bibles, this starts in Second Chronicles 29. But the temple is a wreck. The temple is a mess. This is the meeting place between God and man. And Hezekiah sends the priests into the temple in 2 Chronicles chapter 9, verses 16 through 17. Read these words. The priests went into the inner part of the house of the Lord to cleanse it and to bring out all the uncleanness that they found in the temple of the Lord. What does it mean to get out the uncleanness? It doesn't just mean that they cleaned it or they got rid of the dust and the dirt. That literally the meeting place between God and man, the place where they were supposed to shed the blood of the lamb on the ark of the covenant to bring atonement for the people, this very place is filled with idolatry. There's literally idols in the place that is supposed to be solely and wholly dedicated unto the Lord God Almighty. And they go in and they begin to cleanse it. The Bible says that they brought out all the uncleanness that they found in the temple of the Lord into the core of the house of the Lord's. And the Levites took it and carried it to the brook Kidron. They began to consecrate on the first day of the first month. And on the eighth day of the month, they came to the vegetable of the Lord. Then for eight days, they consecrated the house of the Lord. And on the 16th day of the first month, they were finished. This is a picture of self-examination. There were things in the temple that should not have been there and needed to come out. And there was things that should be in the temple that are not in the temple and they got those things in. What does the Bible say you are? You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And this is sanctification. This is self-examination. It is the idea of examining our temple and taking the things out of this temple that do not need to be there. And putting the things that should be in this temple. Amen. And saying we're going to get that back in the temple. This is self-examination. Taking out and putting in. And never stopping that to the day we die. This is self-examination. Hezekiah has this idea of no excuses. Let me show you what I mean. In the very next verse it says... For the king and his princes and all the assembly in Jerusalem had taken counsel to keep the Passover in the second month. Now, when you read that, that might not be a shocker to you, but any Jew that read that would say, that's not when you celebrate Passover. That's not when you celebrate the Passover. In Exodus chapter 12, God instituted the Passover. And listen to this. God said his redemption, that the blood of the lamb is so central, it changed their calendar. God said, I'm going to give you a new calendar. I'm going to give you a new way to track time because redemption is so center, it changed their calendar. And he said, this is now the beginning of months for you. And isn't that true that salvation coming from death to life, newness of life, that's when life really begins. And he says, you will celebrate it the first month. The first month. But as we just read, they're celebrating it the second month. Why? Well, I'm so glad you asked this morning. In Numbers chapter 9, I encourage you to read this. This is fascinating. This is one of those passages you read and you're kind of just, you're, 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 it's, like a, it's like a marathon. It's hard reading, but it's, it's very powerful if you pay attention. In Numbers chapter 9, a couple men come up to Moses and they say, we want to celebrate the Passover. But we have come in contact with a dead body. We're unclean. We are unworthy to partake of the Passover. And they ask Moses, what do we do? 
And Moses is a good pastor. He goes, I don't got a clue. But I know who does. I'll go to the Lord. Because there's no scripture written on this yet. This is a, a scenario that's really the exception, not the rule. Moses doesn't know what to do. So he inquires of the Lord. And the Lord says, if there's anyone who's unclean, who's unworthy to take the Passover in the second month, they will postpone it to the second month. What is Hezekiah saying? L listen, Hezekiah is saying, we're unworthy. We have to wait. And no, they did not come in contact with a physical dead body. But Hezekiah is going before the whole nation and saying, but we have been playing in the deadness of our sin. And although we've been given resurrection life and newness of life, we've been born again and our sins are far as the east is from the west. He's saying we still find our coffins so comfortable. So Hezekiah looks at the entire nation and says, we are unclean. We are unworthy. We have to wait. And my question for us this morning is, what if America got that kind of conviction where Easter is coming up that there's such a conviction by the leaders and pastors of America. They got in their pulpits and said, Easter's supposed to be next week, but we have to wait because we don't truly have the resurrection message in our hearts and we need to fast and pray and repent and seek the face of God. And then we can celebrate that Jesus is alive. Can you see the powerful revival taking place in Second Chronicles chapter 30? So remedy number one, no excuses. Real examination. Rem remedy number two, the reading the submitting, and the proclaiming of God's word. So Hezekiah sends out his proclaimers, his preachers, his messengers. And we read in verse 5, So they decreed to make a proclamation throughout all Israel, from Beersheba even to Dan. That, that means from top to bottom. Because at this time, the nation is divided. There's a northern and a southern kingdom and this, debate, this nation is completely polarized and divided. Does that sound familiar? I mean, you can just watch the vice presidential debate and you can quickly come to the conclusion that we are a divided nation. But this divided nation can be brought together with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So even though there's polarization, and even though there's enmity and strife and hatred, it's the gospel that breaks down the dividing wall of hostility, as it says in Ephesians chapter 2. So they began to proclaim the message. Now here's the question. What if Hezekiah personally read the word? And he personally submitted to the word, but did not publicly proclaim the word. How would this story be different? Well, you would have a good Christian leader. He personally would have been enriched and personally would have been sanctified, but his nation would have been left desolate. And I wonder in our homes and communities and schools and where our feet traverse in this city where God wants to bring revival, reformation, and transformation, but we're personally reading the word, we're personally submitting to the word, but we are not publicly proclaiming that word. We have to open our mouths and proclaim this gospel for in it is the power of salvation first to the Jew and also to the Greek and it says I am not ashamed of this gospel. The scriptures say you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. 
And there is freedom awaiting those in our reach, but we have to open our mouths. We have to speak the truth. And if you do that, the scriptures say that God will accomplish his purposes because his word will not return void. That is our God. So remedy number two, the reading, the submitting, and the proclaiming of God's word. And just for the sake of time, I can't read the entire message, but I encourage you to read it when you get home. The message is this. Don't be a stiff-necked people. Stop suppressing the conviction of Almighty God. <laughs> These preachers say, don't be like your father. Start something new in your life in the generation of your children. And if you return to me, I will return to you. This is hard preaching of repentance, but also a message of if you come and repent, you will find grace. Remedy number two, the reading, submitting, and public proclaiming of God's word. Remedy number three, listening to the right voices and ignoring the wrong ones. So what happens when these preachers, when Redemption Church begins proclaiming? Well, we read in verses 10 through 12. So the couriers went from city to city through the country of Ephraim and Manasseh and as far as Zebulun, but listen, but they laughed them to scorn and mock them. If you are going to be a Christian today, you are going to face persecution. We no longer live in a world that's neutral to Christianity. We now live in a negative world where it will cost you something to follow Jesus Christ. This is why Peter says, do not be surprised at the fiery trials coming upon you. This is why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 verse 10, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is in the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they are reviling you and slandering you and saying all kinds of evil against you, for great is your reward in heaven. Today, if you are a Christian, you will be laughed at to scorn. And the thing that's interesting about this passage is this passage is not talking about some weird secondary doctrine. What are these preachers talking about? They're trying to gather a whole nation to do what? To praise God and glorify him and sing to him and worship to him and sacrifice to him over the precious blood of the Lamb. And it's over that central teaching that they're laughing and mocking and scorning at. And we have to be a people who ignore the wrong voices. Because there will be voices who hear. And there will be acceptors and rejectors. And we keep preaching for those who have ears to truly hear. We have to learn to ignore the right voices. And you might be new on your, in your walk with Christ. Or you may have backslidden and now getting back into things. Or maybe this is your first Sunday or first couple Sundays in a long time and you're getting in the groove of things. And you're going to have to learn to ignore the wrong voices. Because 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 33 says, Bad company corrupts good character. That even men and women of excellent character, of an excellent foundation, if they hang around the wrong voices, they will begin to corrupt. It says bad company. It doesn't say lost company. Because Christians can be bad company too. Can I get an amen? amen. That not everyone who claims the name of Christ is going to be healthy or edifying, or encouraging, or anything helpful with your walk with God. In fact, this is a quote-unquote Christian nation we're talking about, and those in the southern part of the kingdom who claim to be God's nation are mocking the blood of the Lamb. Does that sound familiar? But we have to learn to ignore 
the wrong voices, but also we have to learn to listen to the right ones, to push through the naysayers and listen to those who've received the message. Listen, they laughed and scorned and mocked. However, the Bible says, however, some men of Asher and Manasseh and Zebulun, listen, humbled themselves and came to Jerusalem. Anytime we preach the message of grace, there will be those who humble themselves. There will be those who accept and receive the message gladly. And these are the people you need to hang on to. These are the people who, I didn't know you before I came to this church, but you are now closer than blood because we have been both bought by blood. That I, I didn't know your background or your story, and we came from different economic backgrounds, but through the blood of Jesus Christ, we're now in a coalition together for the gospel of Jesus Christ and his great commission to make disciples of all nations. Amen. We have to learn to listen to the right voices. Now, we keep reading. It says, and the hand of God was also on Judah to give them one heart, to do what the king and the princes commanded by the word of the Lord. If we read the word and submit to the word and publicly proclaim the word, the hand of God will begin to touch the hearts of those in the city and the hearts of those in this church and the hearts of those in your homes. And the hand of God will bring a people together for his honor and glory. To make that happen, you have to learn to ignore the wrong voices. Let them continue the mock. Because as they mock, there's people who are humbled. And as they scorn, the very hand of God is touching lives in your community, in your homes. Remedy number three, listening to the right voices and ignoring the wrong ones. Remedy number four, expect conviction. Expect Conviction. It's, it's interesting. We get the verse 15 and they're doing it. I mean, they haven't celebrated Passover. It says in, in the King James in verse 5, it says they, they have not celebrated the Passover in a long time. Or other translations say as often as prescribed. And they're doing it. But the leaders, that is the Levites and the priests doing the Passover, something interesting happens. It says in verse 15, and they slaughtered the Passover lamb. On the 14th day... Of the second month, and the priests and the Levites were ashamed. They were ashamed. Expect godly shame. Expect conviction. Even when you're going down the right path, even as you begin to walk a life of obedience, expect conviction. Why are they feeling shame? Well, imagine. God has wanted you to go one direction. He's been wanting you to do ministry and life and obedience one way. But for far too long, you've been running in the complete opposite direction. And what happens when you start turning around? Your eyes and your heart are enlightened and you begin to see all the things you've missed. I mean, can I just be transparent? I think about parenting. I have three wonderful boys. And I'll hear something from an older, godly Christian about parenting. And then I'll say, why weren't you there when my first child was born? And why couldn't I just keep you there for like my whole childing experience? Because obviously I don't know anything. And that's the Christian walk that as we begin to walk in obedience will begin to experience conviction. Expect conviction, but also expect encouragement. I love this. this. This is one of my favorite parts of this passage. It says in verse 18 and 19, but for a majority of the people, many of them from Ephraim, Manasseh, Issachar, and Zebulun, listen, had not cleansed themselves yet as they ate the Passover. In other words, they're not doing it right. That God wants them to celebrate the precious blood of the Lamb one way, but they're not doing it according to the Scriptures. Now listen, they had not cleansed themselves yet. They ate the Passover otherwise than as prescribed. For Hezekiah had prayed for them, saying, May the good Lord pardon everyone, listen, 
who sets his heart to seek God. The Lord God of his fathers, even though not according to the sanctuary rules of uncleanness. And listen, and the Lord heard Hezekiah and healed the people. They're not doing it right. But listen, God saw that their heart was set to seek God. And even when we don't get everything right, God sees a heart that desires to obey him. When I go and examine my child, if he's in rebellion, I'll discipline and correct him. But if he is trying to obey the voice of the Father and he's unable because his weakness, that's when I come down and say, I'm going to help you, son. And many people in this room have a heart to obey God. But you give up because it's been far too long and your weakness is so apparent. And God in that moment says, my power is made perfect in your weakness. So yes, expect conviction, but also expect comfort. And remedy number five, know in hard times, if you repent and know it's not too late, you will have joy that has not been experienced for generations. So they finally do it. It's, it's been too long, but it's not too late. And they begin to celebrate the Passover. And we read in verse 26, so there was great joy in Jerusalem for since the time of Solomon. This is going way back. Generation after generation after generation. Since the time of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, there had been nothing like this in Jerusalem. Listen, if you get this message and you get God back at the center of your life, you will have joy that your father hasn't had and that your father's father hasn't had. There is generational joy waiting to be experienced for those who say it's been too long, but it's not too late. It's not too late for you. In this passage, I love it. The celebration of Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread are directly related. Because after God passes over and they're redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, the Feast of Unleavened Bread celebrates how they had to leave so quickly they couldn't put leaven in their bread. And they leave in booths and tents. It's supposed to be a seven-day celebration. And after the seven days, they all got together and they said, let's do it another seven days. Why is that? Because these people were so spiritually hungry and thirsty. And when they had a taste of the goodness of God, they said, I never want this to end. And if you've been far from God and far from his calling and far from his purposes and plans, when you get a taste of it, you'll say, I will never want this to end. And you don't have to wait till Easter or Christmas or next Sunday or for the next guest speaker. Today's the day of salvation. Today's the day of reformation. Today's the day of revival and change. Because it's been too long, it's not too late for you. Don't give up, it's not too late for you. This nation is like Ezekiel 37. It's a valley of dry bones, brittle bones, where nothing good can come from it. But God sees that that can be raised to life and be used for his purposes and glory and be used as an army for the glory of God. You say it's too long. I shout to you today, it is not too late. It's not too late for your prodigal son or daughter. It's not too late for you to be the husband, the father, the mother, the wife you are called to be. It is not too late, Christian, who has buried their talents and giftings in the ground. It is not too late. How does Hezekiah get this nation that's been far gone for too long back to God? He knew his God. He had a, a very large view of God. Now with him, nothing is impossible. Jonah 2, 9, salvation belongs to the Lord our God. And Hezekiah knew it's been far too long since we walked in obedience, but it is not too late. It's not too late for you. 
it's not too late. Let's pray. Father, why do we go through these hard things of self-examination, making no excuses? publicly proclaiming the word and getting mocked at and scorned. Experiencing conviction and shame when we're trying to do things right. It's because we can experience joy that has not been experienced in generations when we rightly walk with you. It's not too late for you. It's not too late for your family. It's not too late on your calling. It's not too late. You see death, God sees resurrection. You see hopelessness, God sees a testimony for his glory to show his goodness and his power and his redemption. You see a nation too far gone. It is not too late for the United States of America. It's not too late. It's not too late for this city. It's not too late for your home. It is not too late for you. It's been far too long but it's not too late. Father, I pray as we go into time of prayer and worship, will you help us to tangibly experience the hope that this message brings? Pray as we worship. If you have any needs, please come. If you said it was, it's been too long, no, it's not too late. If you have needs, please come. We would love to pray for you. In Jesus' name, amen.